The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Katie DeBold, and I'm an inspector with the Missouri Board of Pharmacy. I also have with me Tom Glensky, the chief inspector, and he'll be assisting me during the question and answer portion for today. So I'll be reviewing some of the new emergency rule requirements related to training, so aseptic technique, skill assessment, and media fills. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. The webinar is designed that all participants are muted and you should be in listen-only mode. If you're having problems with your GoToWebinar, you can also call in using the access code and listen by the telephone. This webinar is board approved for one hour of live pharmacist continuing education. You must be officially signed up and logged on via your computer. So if you're watching with a group of people, only one person will get the CE, and that's the person that is signed up. CE credit will not be issued to those that are listening over the phone. You'll need to complete a post-survey within 48 hours of the webinar, and we'll give instructions of how to do that at the end of the webinar. Just a reminder that CE credit is not submitted to the CPE monitor. Instead, you will be getting a certificate mailed to you. There are handouts posted on the board's websites for today's webinar, and this webinar is also being recorded. You will be able to find a copy of this webinar under the Publications and Resources link on the board's website. Just a reminder that there is no CE credit for watching the recorded version, only the live version. If you have questions during the webinar, feel free to ask them in your question box, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. So I'd like to start off with some webinar objectives, pretty basic. I'm going to be providing guidance on aseptic technique skill assessment and media fill testing, which are some new, newer requirements in our emergency sterile compounding rule, and I'll also be answering questions. So I would like to get started with a review of why training is so important. Having a consistent and dependable employee work practice is one of the most important factors to ensure safe sterile compounding. And that's because studies have demonstrated a contamination rate of 5.1% among compounded sterile preparations. Most often that contamination can be traced back to personnel issues. So maybe there was a breach in aseptic technique or sterilization methods, or maybe there was an issue with garbing. But most of the time, it can be traced back to being that personnel were the source of the contamination. Many pharmacy schools and educational programs for technicians lack hands-on ster sterile compounding training, so it's important for pharmacies to provide that training for our employees. Another reason is that studies have shown that pharmacies with robust training programs have, retained, have the chance of retaining their employees for much longer than those that do not. Their employees often feel more valued and they like to be shown that you have an interest in your education. Therefore, not only are we decreasing the chance of patient harm, but we are increasing the chance of retaining our employees for a longer period of time. So all of that combined is what we need to do in order to reduce the chance of contamination uh, during our compounding practices. So the board requires that every pharmacy effectively train their sterile compounding personnel. However, there aren't any specific requirements of how this should be done. So I've compiled here some good building blocks of a strong sterile compounding training program. So you should have your employees uh, review your pharmacy's policies and procedures so they have a good idea of how things are done at your pharmacy. It's also a good idea to have them review state and federal regulations as they apply to sterile compounding. So things would include the Board of Pharmacy compounding regulations um, or USP 797. That would be a good review for your employees. You can employ written tests to go over important materials. So you can either make up your own tests or you can use a pre-made test. Just make sure that if you're using a pre-made test from another organization that, th that that test is current and that it has current information on it. 
Calculations often play an important role in sterile compounding, so you want to make sure that your employees are proficient at doing math and calculations. So it's often a good idea to incorporate some calculation review and then also a test. There are a lot of sterile compounding videos out there that help to demonstrate um, things like aseptic technique and cleaning. There are a numerous amount of online sterile compounding courses that can help um, give some employees some guidance on sterile compounding, and they often have built-in uh, tests, so that, that's often a good resource. It's a good idea to have your employees shadow, your new employees shadow your existing employees so they get an idea of what your work practices are like, and also have a lot of demonstrations so that your new employees can see the proper way that things are done. It's also important to provide ample time for practice and to have ample time to ask questions so that your employees feel comfortable before they go ahead and complete your aseptic technique skill assessment and media fill, which would kind of be your ending test. It's also important to make sure that the training is consistent among all your sterile compounding personnel, and this is true regardless of prior experience. So even if you hire someone that has 10 plus years of sterile compounding, you have no idea what their previous training consisted of, they might have picked up bad habits along the way, or maybe their education just wasn't that strong. So it's up to the pharmacy to provide that training to make sure that their personnel have the training, the same training all across the board. So, so those are some good components of building a strong sterile compounding program. So personnel education and training requirements in the new emergency rule say that all compounding staff must take and pass an aseptic technique skill assessment, and that should include a direct visual observation during a process simulation. So this visual observation should be done by a competent individual. It could be someone um, that has knowledge of sterile compounding, so maybe your pharmacist in charge. It could be a supervisor of some sort. It could even be um, maybe one of your um, technicians that has been doing sterile compounding a long time and they're very proficient in sterile compounding, any of those people would be a good option for who to do, who needs to do the visual observation. And when I say all sterile compounding personnel, that's also including any rotational students that come through your pharmacy. If you plan for them to be doing any compounding, they need to go through the training and the media fill process. If you have pharmacists that only work on the weekend or maybe students that only work on the weekend, if they are doing sterile compounding within your sterile compounding area, they need to be trained appropriately and they need to do the media fill testing. So when does this assessment need to occur? It needs to occur initially upon hire and it must be completed before allowing the personnel to perform sterile compounding at your facility. After that, a reassessment must be done according to your risk level. So risk level 1 and 2, the reassessment needs to occur every 12 months, and if you are risk level 3, the reassessment should occur every 6 months. So the aseptic technique skill assessment is the visual, direct visual observation portion of the assessment, and that includes the following competencies. I will be going into each competency in more detail to go over what exactly should be assessed, but I will just do a broad overview here. So the first competency that needs to be observed is proper aseptic technique, manipulations, and work practices, and then cleaning and disinfection, hand hygiene, gloving, and garbing, identifying, weighing, and measuring of ingredients, maintaining sterility in ISO class 5 areas, and also labeling and inspecting compounded sterile preparations for quality. So those competencies need to be completed by all risk levels. If you are a risk level 2 or 3 compounder, there are also some additional competencies that you will need to do. And that would include any equipment that you're using. You want to have your employees demonstrate that they are able to use them correctly. So things like automated compounding devices, so uh, TPN compounder. If you have sterilization equipment, so autoclaves, dry heat ovens, things like that, you want to ensure that your employees are using those properly. If you are risk level 3 and you are sterilizing um, your product, so you're going from non-sterile and then sterilizing it during the compounding process, you need to ensure that your employees are able to uh, do your sterilization methods correctly. Filter integrity testing, otherwise known as a bubble point test. Again, if you are compounding non-sterile and then making it sterile with your 0.22 micron filter, after that sterilization process is completed, 
you need to test that filter to ensure that the filter's integrity is acceptable and that it actually did its job during the sterilization process. So since that's such an important tool within compounding, you want to ensure that your employees are competent in uh, doing that filter integrity test. And then end preparation testing, uh, if you are sending your samples to a lab, you want to ensure that the employee is sending the right amount of samples, uh, the right amount of volume, that they are selecting the appropriate tests that need to be completed and that sort of thing. So when you're risk level two or three, you will have additional competencies um, other than the six that are listed above. So the first competency is one of the more important ones. It is proper aseptic technique, manipulations, and work practices. So some things to assess during this visual observation include avoiding touch contamination. So there are a lot of critical sites that should be not be touched during sterile compounding. Touch contamination is one of the most common sources of, of contamination within compounded sterile preparations. So it's important that employees are trained that they do not touch the critical sites. So some critical sites that should not be touched include the needle and the needle hub. So I provided some pictures to your right there, and you can see the needle hub is the section of the needle that either uh, screws onto the syringe or is slipped onto the syringe. So the hub of the needle should not be touched, and then the entire needle itself should not be touched. The syringe tip should not be touched, and then also the syringe plunger. So the flange on the very bottom of the plunger and the flange that is on, uh, on the barrel are okay to be touched, but that plunger um, in the middle should not be touched. Other critical sites include vial and bag ports, and then also if you're using tubing and dispensing pin, the spikes on the ends of those should not be touched. So the definition of a critical site is basically anything in which the final uh, drug is touching, that would be considered a critical site. So there might be more than what is listed here. Another important aspect of aseptic technique is the proper use of first air, which I will be going into more detail on the next slide. Other appropriate disinfection practices, so this isn't um, the entire cleaning and disinfection competency, but it's just common things that you should see that are part of good aseptic technique. So Examples would be disinfecting items prior to placing them within the primary engineering control, and that is required for all risk levels. Frequent glove disinfection throughout the compounding process, especially if um, you touch something non-sterile, so if you go to answer the phone or something like that, definitely want to disinfect your gloves after um, things like that. And then also swabbing your vial and bag ports with sterile alcohol pads. If you are a risk level three compounder, this uh, would also include the sterilization of risk level three compounds that kind of goes into the work practices uh, portion of this competency. So proper use of first air. This is something that I see um, on inspection that is often done incorrectly. So I just wanted to review some of the essentials of how to use first air properly. So the definition of first air is the air exiting the HEPA filter in a unidirectional airstream. So the purpose, one of the main purposes of a primary engineering control is to provide HEPA filtered air at a velocity that is fast enough to sweep away any particles and microorganisms from critical sites. So in order to allow the primary engineering control to do its job effectively, we need to keep those critical sites within first air at all times. So if you have a bag port, you want it to be facing the first air. If you have uh, vials, any uh, needles, they all need to be kept within the first air. So anything that's blocking the first air, so your hands or any other compounding supplies, results in turbulent air. So the turbulent air, uh, means that the air is kind of going around in circles. It won't be at a velocity that is sufficient enough to sweep away those harmful particles or microorganisms. So essentially, once you've blocked those critical sites, the primary engineering control is not able to do its job effectively, and it could result in contamination. So how to determine where the first air comes from will depend upon your primary engineering control. If you look at within your primary engineering control, you need to find the location of the HEPA filter. If you have a vertical flow primary engineering control, so an example would be a biological safety cabinet or a RABS, which remember RABS is the new terminology for isolator. 
you'll notice that the HEPA filter is located on the ceiling of the unit, so that's where the first air is coming from. So you want to make sure that nothing is hanging above your direct compounding area, um, and the way you position your hands will be a little different. If you have a horizontal flow primary engineering control, so your more traditional laminar airflow workbench, your HEPA filter is located on the back of the unit, and your first air will be coming uh, from the back towards the compounder. So again, you'll need to be cognizant of your hand placement and then also how your supplies are laid out. So I've included some pictures of what uh, first air should look like. So in a horizontal primary engineering control, the air is coming from the back of the unit, and the picture on the left is a demonstration of poor first air technique when the air is coming from the back of the unit. So the first thing you should notice in this picture is that, of course, the woman is not garbed, so that in itself is a problem. But aside from that, you can see that her hand is blocking uh, the critical site of the vial septum and the needle and the syringe tip. So with her hand blocking those items, there is no way that the first air is getting to those critical sites, so the air is not able to sweep away any potential particles or microorganisms. So that sort of technique can result in contamination. The picture on the right is an example of good first air technique in a horizontal flow primary engineering control. You can see the compounder has his hand separated in a way that allows the, the first air to wash over um, all of those critical sites. So that would be an example of good first air technique. Another important thing to evaluate within your horizontal primary engineering control is that some primary engineering controls, some older models, will have um, a lip at the very bottom of their filter, so the filter does not come completely to the bottom of the work surface area, and if you do um, hold smoke up to where that lip is, you'll notice that there's a lot of turbulent air down where that lip meets the work surface area. So they do make diffuser screens, which acts um, as a way to diffuse the first air over that lip. So then that way you have first air all the way from the very top of your uh, filter all the way to the very bottom. So if you're unsure if you have one of these lips or if it affects your first air, I would recommend asking your certifier. And they can uh, do a smoke study to show you uh, where the turbulent air, or if there's any turbulent air in that area where the filter meets the work surface area. So the next slide demonstrates the proper use of first air in a vertical flow primary engineering control. So vertical flow, you can see that the HEPA filter is located on the ceiling of, of the primary engineering control, so that is where the first air will be coming from. The picture on the left is a picture of poor first air technique in a vertical flow primary engineering control. So you can see that the compounder is holding the vial and syringe straight up and down. So if you imagine the air is coming from up above, there is no way that those critical sites in the, in the middle there, so the vial septum and the needle, are being reached by that first air. The first air would simply hit the top of the vial and then cascade off of it, uh, with resulting in a lot of turbulent air. So that, uh, whenever you work in a vertical flow primary engineering control, you kind of have to turn your syringe and your vial on more of a 45 degree angle in order to allow the first air to flow over those critical sites. So the picture on the right is an example of good first air technique in a vertical flow primary engineering control. Instead of inserting the drug straight up and down, she's turning it on a 45 degree angle and inserting the drug that way. It's also important to remember when you're working in a vertical flow primary engineering control that if you have a bar above you or you're, and that you're hanging things on the bar, that you want to push those items more to the right or the left. You don't want them to be hanging directly over your compounding area because, of course, again, that will create um, turbulent airflow. So the next competency is cleaning and disinfection. So on my last webinar, I discussed cleaning and disinfection more thoroughly. Uh, so if you want some more thorough um, instruction, you can refer to that webinar, but I will review it briefly here as well. So all personnel, including non-pharmacy personnel, that perform cleaning in a controlled or buffer area need to be trained and they need to demonstrate cleaning and disinfection competencies. So even if the non-pharmacy personnel aren't even touching the primary engineering control, if they're just cleaning your floors or your walls and their ceilings, if they're cleaning in your control or buffer area, they still need to be trained and demonstrate the following competencies, or the cleaning and disinfection competency. 
So some things to assess during the cleaning and disinfection competency include the proper dilution of cleaning agents. I talked about in my last webinar how important it is to properly dilute your cleaning agents. A lot of cleaning agents come uh, ready to use, and in that case, no dilution is necessary. However, if you are diluting your cleaning agents, you need to put the correct amount in. So if it's too concentrated, it can cause uh, corrosive or caustic damage to your equipment, and if it's too dilute, the disinfectant could be um, ineffective and not able to do its job. <clears throat> Just a reminder that if you are diluting a uh, cleaning agent to be used in your primary engineering control, you need to use sterile water. However, if you are diluting a cleaning agent for use on the floors or the ceilings, or the walls, you could just use tap water. So sterile water, if you're using the agent in your primary engineering control, tap water is okay for all other areas. You want to make sure that your employees have uh, the knowledge of the appropriate contact time for your disinfectant. So you'll need to refer to your manufacturer to get an idea of what that contact, contact time is. And the contact time is the amount of time that the product needs to remain on a surface. It allows the disinfectant time to pass into the cell membrane and to reach the desired target site. So uh, the contact time will vary. Uh, it can be less than 30 seconds. It can go all the way up to 10 minutes. It's usually longer if you're using a sporocytal of some type, um, but you just need to uh, look at your manufacturer to get that information and then make sure that your employees are um, leaving that disinfectant on for the appropriate contact time. You want to ensure that your employees have are selecting the proper cleaning tools and materials. So if you have dedicated tools or buckets for your um, buffer or controlled area, they need to be using those. You don't want to be using the same mop that you're using in the rest of your pharmacy, for example. You want to make sure the cleaning uh, materials are low lint, so they're non-shedding, things like that. Proper cleaning methods need to be employed by the employees, so they should know uh, the order that things should be cleaned in, so cleanest to dirtiest. They should be using overlapping strokes instead of a circular motion. You want to make sure that your employees are able to effectively clean your primary engineering control, so you want to make sure that they are cleaning things in the correct order, that they are using the correct cleaning agents, that they are cleaning um, in a top to bottom fashion, cleanest to dirtiest fashion, things like that. And then lastly, you want to make sure that they have the knowledge of proper cleaning frequencies. So they should know what is done daily versus monthly. If your pharmacy employs weekly cleaning, you'd want to, you'd want to make sure that your employee um, knows that what is done daily versus weekly versus monthly. So the next competency is hand hygiene, gloving, and garbing. So again, all personnel, including non-pharmacy personnel, that enter your controlled or buffer area must be able to demonstrate hand hygiene, gloving, and garbing procedures. Because remember, anyone that enters a controlled or buffer area needs to be properly garbed. And that is to reduce the chance of contamination within your controlled or buffer area. So if you have cleaning personnel coming into your controlled or buffer area, not only do they need to be trained in the cleaning and disinfection competency, but they need to be trained and demonstrate the hand hygiene, gloving, and garbing competency. So again, I went over all of these in more detail on my last webinar, so if you missed that and want some more information, feel free to go find the recording for that. So things to assess for the hand hygiene competency include washing your hands and your forearms for 30 seconds, and you want to use a clock to time this. You shouldn't use a subjective song that you sing or anything like that. You want to make sure that the employee washes all areas of their hands, so fingertips, thumbs, in between fingers, etc. They should be removing debris from underneath their fingernails, and they should be drying off their hands and arms. Once they turn off the sink, they should use a hands-free procedure. So you don't want to use your freshly washed hand to turn off the faucet. Instead, you should use um, either a towel or uh, your elbow to turn off the sink. So things to assess during the gloving competency would include that uh, your employee is choosing the appropriate gloves. So depending upon your risk level, you, uh, the employee should don either sterile gloves for risk level 2 or 3, Non-sterile gloves would be okay for risk level one, and then if you're compounding hazardous drugs, you would need to don chemo gloves. Um, and a lot of times different pharmacies will have 
you know, some of each. So you want to make sure that your employee is donning the correct glove for whatever uh, duty they're about to perform. You want to make sure that they choose the appropriate glove size. So if the glove is too small for them, you risk the chance of tearing the glove. If it's too large, it might slide off, um, slide down the person's hand, exposing their wrist skin. Um, and it, it's just harder to work in altogether. So you want to make sure that they're choosing the appropriate size of glove. You want to make sure that when they don the glove that they are pulling the glove over the sleeve of the gown and not underneath the gown. And that helps to uh, keep the, the exposure risk of your wrist down when you pull it over the gown. If you are using sterile gloves for risk level two or three, you, that is required. You want to make sure that your employees are donning sterile gloves appropriately and that they are not contaminating them. A good way to assess this is to do fingertip sampling. So fingertip sampling is not required by our rule. However, it is a good uh, thing to do to, in order um, to assess if your employees are donning the sterile gloves appropriately without contaminating them. So that is something to think about. If you are using a RABS, or um, remember that's the new terminology for isolator, your employees should be donning the sterile gloves inside the RABS. For the Garvin competency, you want to assess uh, the following. So you want to make sure that your employees are removing their outer garments, jewelry, and makeup, as all three of those are big particle generators. And if you remember from my past webinar, particles essentially equal microorganisms, so you want to um, reduce that chance of that from happening. You want to make sure that your employees are donning garb in the appropriate area. This may uh, vary depending upon your facility setup, but whatever area that you have, um, have uh, decided to be the garbing area, that is where the garbing needs to occur. You want to make sure that your employees are darning garb, donning garb in the appropriate order. So that includes hair cover followed by beard cover if applicable, face masks, shoe covers. Next, they need to wash their hands and then don a non-shedding gown. Best practice would be to apply an alcohol-based hand rub at this point, and that is to protect uh, the integrity. If your glove's integrity is compromised, your hands will hopefully uh, be protected against any um, contamination. And then the last step would be to don gloves. If you are uh, risk level two or three, you would need to put on sterile gloves. So we do recognize that um, Steps one through three might be variable depending upon your facility. So you might need to don your shoe covers before you don your hair covers, and that would be acceptable. However, steps four through seven should kind of remain the same among all the pharmacies. You want to assess that your employees are not reusing garb at any time except for gowns. Gowns are able to be reused, but they should be reused only for sterile compounding and for one shift only. So they shouldn't be wearing their sterile compounding uh, gown when they're out helping patients in the front of the pharmacy. They should only be wearing it for sterile compounding and for one shift only. So the next competency is identifying, weighing, and measuring ingredients. So you want to ensure that your personnel are able to select the appropriate ingredients or materials for whatever compounding activity that they are going to pursue. So some pharmacies, you may have some differences in preservative-free versus um, drugs that have preservatives in them. So sometimes it might be necessary to use the preservative-free. Some pharmacies might have uh, drugs that are available both sterile and non-sterile. So depending upon what sort of compounding activity you're, you're going to do, you want to make sure that they're choosing the appropriate drug there. If you are doing risk level three compounding, you want to ensure that your employees are using sterilized glassware if, if that's applicable. Or if you are utilizing filters as part of your sterilization methods, you want to make sure that they are using a 0.22 pharmaceutical grade sterilizing filter instead of, say, um, a five micron filter that might be used for filtering ampules. So you want to make sure that that's being chosen appropriately. You also want to make sure that personnel are able to use your equipment properly. So if you're using scales on a daily basis, that would be something that you would want to test. You want to make sure that employees are able to read syringes correctly, that they are reading uh, the top portion of the black plunger and not the bottom portion. For filters, you want to ensure that they are using the correct filters, um, like I said before, 
uh, a sterilizing filter versus just a regular ampule filter. If you are using filters for sterilizing, you need to recognize that they most of them have a maximum volume that uh, solution can be filtered through, so you want to make sure that your employees recognize that, that they are selecting the right type of filter. There are hydrophilic filters and there are hydrophobic filters, so you want to make sure that is being uh, chosen for the right, the right kind of drug that you have. You want to make sure that your employees are not stacking filters, so putting uh, two filters on top of each other, things like that. If you have autoclaves or dry heat ovens, you want to make sure that your employees know how to use those correctly. So you want to make sure that they're being loaded properly, they're being run at the proper temperature for the proper amount of time. If you use biological indicators, you want to make sure that they are using those correctly, etc. If you use automated compounding devices or fluid transfer pumps, it's also a good idea to make sure that your employees are able to use equipment properly um, with those two items. So the next competency is maintaining sterility in ISO class 5 areas. This competency is kind of similar to the aseptic technique competency. You want to make sure that your employees are maintaining proper aseptic technique while they're compounding. They should be disinfecting their gloves and the work surface frequently, and they should be using the uh, proper equipment. So an example of maintaining sterility in ISO class 5 area would be in risk level 3 compounders. Once, they have once you have sterilized your preparation, you want to make sure it remains sterile. So you wouldn't want to pour it into uh, a non-sterile piece of glassware or a non-sterile vial or something like that. Lastly, in the aseptic technique skill assessment section, the last competency is labeling and inspecting of compounded sterile preparations. So you want to ensure that your personnel are able to label your preparations appropriately. A lot of times I see uh, two different labels that print out for preparations. One is kind of a recipe, while the other one is the label that goes on the actual um, preparation. So you want to make sure that your employees know the difference and are able to apply the appropriate label. They need to be able to assign the appropriate beyond use state to the label, and they should be able to tell you where to find this information if it's not readily available. So if you have a binder of some sort or a list where they can reference what beyond use states are, they should be able to tell you where that information is located. And then also affixing any applicable auxiliary labels to your bag. So whether that be storage requirement or maybe something that denotes if it's a hazardous drug, things like that. You should also make sure that your personnel are able to inspect preparations for integrity. So that would include things like holes or leaks, looking for cores or particulate matter, and then also assessing the, the solution for appropriate color, volume, clarity, that sort of thing. So in addition to the initial, initial and ongoing reassessments, there may be times when additional retraining or reassessment needs to occur. So additional reassessments must occur in the following situations. If your quality assurance program yields an unacceptable result, you need to do some retraining or reassessment. So an example of that would be environmental sampling results have exceeded your 797 action levels. So if you have done a remedial investigation and you see that the type of CFU or microorganism from your sampling points to a personnel issue, um, so maybe you think that it was due to a garbing issue or touch contamination, it would be a good idea to retrain your employees and do a reassessment at that point. If your end preparation testing results are out of specification, so if you have a failed sterility, it, you need to do a reassessment of your employees at that point. If you observe any unacceptable techniques during the visual observation of either hand hygiene, garbing, or aseptic technique competencies, your employees must be retrained and they must pass three successive reevaluations in that deficient area before they can resume sterile compounding. So if the employee um, did okay on the hand hygiene and they did okay on the aseptic technique, but they failed the garbing, so maybe they forgot to uh, put on a face mask during their visual observation, then they would need to do um, a retraining and they would have to be reevaluated three times in the proper garbing procedure. But since they passed the hand hygiene and the aseptic technique portion, those would be okay. So they would only have to retrain in the area that was deficient. So in this example, in the garbing. 
if there are changes in risk level, so you decide that you want to do um, your risk level two and you want to um, start doing risk level three, there's obviously going to be a lot of training and reassessment that go into that. If you have any big changes in your compounding methods, you would also need to do a reassessment. So if you have um, some new technology that you get in, uh, maybe some workflow um, technology or um, an automated compounding device, you would need to do some reassessments um, for that type of compounding change. So moving on to media fills. Media fills are an important tool used to test aseptic competencies of your employees. And media fill testing in the emergency rule shall comply with USP Chapter 797 procedures. So the definition of media fill test within 797 is a test used to qualify a subject technique of compounding personnel. During this test, a microbiological growth media is substituted for the actual drug product to simulate admixture compounding. So basically, if any microorganisms are introduced during that compounding process, they will grow within the media, and that would demonstrate improper aseptic, aseptic competency. <clears throat> So media fill tests are required as part of the aseptic technique seal assessment, so they need to be completed initially prior to allowing any personnel to perform sterile compounding. A minimum of three media fill tests must be completed during the initial media fill testing. So I'm going to explain the three media fill tests a little bit here. I'll explain how to design the process of your media test on the next slide, but I just wanted to review um, the difference between media fill tests and media fill units. So if you hear the terminology media fill unit, that is referring to the number of media fill containers that you have at the end of your test. So an example would be if your pharmacy does a lot of batching of syringes, so maybe you do a lot of pediatric type batching of syringes, you would design your media fill test to result in um, batching, and maybe you've selected a number of 20 different syringes. So at the conclusion of one media fill test, you would have 20 media fill units that need to be incubated. So for initial media fill testing, you would need to prepare, in this example, 20 different units on three different occasions. So you would end up having, by ever, once everything was said and done, you will have incubated 60 different media fill units. So when we say three media fill tests, we're referring to the entire test repeated three times, not that the test results in three media filled containers. We've had um, some confusion, confusion around that, so I just wanted to try and explain that. So initial media fill testing, you need to do three media fill tests. When you're doing your reassessment, that needs to occur according to your risk level. So for risk levels one and two, a reassessment needs to be done every 12 months. And then for risk level three, you'll need to do a reassessment every six months. And during the reassessment, the ongoing media fill, you only need to do one media fill test. So in my previous example, you would just do the one uh, 20 syringe media fill test. A reassessment needs to occur whenever um, an employee fails your media field test. So if you've inspected the media field test and it is, uh, there's some visual turbidity, then that personnel needs to be retrained and they need to pass three media field tests before they can resume sterile compounding again. So that would be similar to when you do your initial media field testing. So media field procedures. Um, the test must be conducted using the most challenging or stressful conditions that a person encounters while compounding. So you want to design your procedure to closely simulate your pharmacy's compounding activities. So you need to evaluate what your pharmacy does and choose the thing that is the most challenging or most stressful, and that is going to be uh, what your test should look like. Uh, it's often recommended that you, as far as time of day of media field tests, that you do the media field test towards the end of the day, because oftentimes um, your personnel are more weary and kind of stressed and tired towards the end of the day, so that would be a good time to do your media field test, because it is a simulation of a more stressful time of day. So when you're designing your procedure, like I said, you need to look at all of your uh, compounding activities and choose the most challenging one. So examples would be if you utilize an automated compounding device or other equipment. There is, of course, a lot of aseptic, 
aseptic connections that occur during um, automated compounding devices, so that would be a good idea to incorporate that into your media field procedure. If you are a risk level 3 compounder, you would want to start out with a non-sterile media and then incorporate whatever your sterilization method is into the test. So you can use um, media fill kits that come um, already put together for you, but you need to evaluate their recommended procedure. When you're reviewing the manufacturer's instructions, you need to think to yourself, does this simulate a compounding process that your pharmacy currently employs? If it um, simulates a process where you're doing 20 different syringe transfers, but your pharmacy doesn't necessarily do that type of batching, then that might not be a good process for you. So feel free to create your own procedure. You don't need to use the manufacturer's instructions. You can um, kind of mix and match to create your own process. So if you use a lot of dispensing pins, for example, you would incorporate that into your media fill procedure. If you do a lot of reconstitution, you would try to find a powder media that you would be able to utilize and things like that. So you want it to uh, represent your most challenging or stressful condition that your compounders uh, encounter. So as far as the types of media, you must use a sterile soybean casein digest media and that's otherwise known as tryptic soy agar or sometimes tryptocase soy agar, and then also tryptocase soy broth. So um, those are essentially um, the same. So as long as you use one of those three, you'll be good. For risk level three compounders, it is essential that you use a non-sterile tryptic soy agar powder. The media is then diluted and sterilized as part of the media fill test. You'll have to refer to your manufacturer regarding how it's diluted. Um, some powders will start out as non-sterile, so you don't really have to do anything extra. Some manufacturers want you to leave the solution open in non-controlled air, and then that way it would collect microorganisms. And then other um, manufacturers might have you dilute it with tap water, and that uh, makes it non-sterile. So depending upon your manufacturer, you might have to do a couple different things, but um, that is what should be done for risk level 3 compounders because you want to start out with a non-sterile media because it is simulating your process um, that you do when you're starting out with a non-sterile drug and then sterilizing it. So you want to make sure that you are not diluting any growth media unless it's specifically directed for by the manufacturer. So powder is okay to be diluted as long as you are following the manufacturer's instructions, but if you have sterile media that's already reconstituted, you don't want to use saline or water to dilute that because um, it can cause uh, the media to not promote microorganism growth, and then in which case you would have a false negative. So even if microorganisms were introduced to that media, it would not have the capability to support the growth of the microorganisms because that media is too dilute. When you receive your media, you should look for a certificate of analysis. The certificate of analysis shows that the manufacturer has done growth promotion tests. So the growth promotion test is a test that is completed to prove that their media is capable of growing microorganisms. If your media does not have the certificate of analysis, you might have a false negative because you are not sure if your media is able to support microorganism growth. So media can be purchased as part of a kit, or it can be purchased as individual components. It's often cheaper if you buy them as individual components, and there's also a variety of different sizes. Um, so they come in vials, ampules, they come in uh, really large vials. So if you are simulating an automated compounding device um, type of media fill, that would be uh, easier to find if you purchase them as individual components. But either is acceptable. Another technique that is used is um, the use of positive controls. So a positive control is when the media is purposely contaminated and incubated to show that it is capable of growth. And uh, one instance when this must be completed is when you are doing a media fill test for risk level 3 compounders. So risk level 3 compounders must have positive controls to prove that your initial preparation was non-sterile at the beginning of your test. One of the main components of a media field test for risk level 3 compounders is that the employee is able to demonstrate proper sterilization techniques. So in order to prove that that was properly done, you need to prove that it was the solution was non-sterile to, to start with. 
So once the non-sterile media is diluted, according to your manufacturer's instructions, you will then transfer some of that fluid to empty vials and you'll save them and incubate them along with the media filled test. So that step needs to be done before the sterilization step. And then those samples at the end of the incubation period should demonstrate positive growth. So then that proves that your solution started out non-sterile and that your employee effectively sterilized that solution and that, that the ones that the media fill units that they sterilize should then hopefully be um, negative growth. So media fill incubation, all media fills need to be incubated at 20 to 25 degrees Celsius or at 30 to 35 degrees Celsius for a minimum of 14 days. Um, if two temperatures are used for incubation, that is acceptable, but then the containers need to be incubated for seven days at each temperature. And usually you start at the lower temperature for seven days and then follow that with the higher temperatures for seven days. Media cannot be incubated at room temperature or for less than 14 days. Even if it's recommended by the manufacturer, you still need to do the full 14 days at the above temperatures that I discussed. So in terms of where to incubate your media fills, you can buy your own incubator and do it that way. You can send out your media fills to different microbiology labs that might do the service for you or oftentimes a certifier will be able to incubate um, your media fills for you. So you'll just kind of have to do some research to figure out uh, where you can get your incubations done. So the next step uh, is to read and document your media fill. So how often to inspect media fills? Um, I think it's best to review them every day. That way, if you have um, any sign of growth, you can then start the process of retraining your employee and then um, doing the repeat media fill tests. But if you are not going to review them every day, you want to review them at a minimum at the halfway point, which is day seven, and then at the very end, which is day 14. Failure is going to be indicated by a visible turbidity in any of the containers on or before 14 days. So you want to inspect every single container. The microbial growth can appear as cloudy, stringy, or clumpy, and you want to be careful when you are reading your media fill test that you're not disturbing the container um, too much. If you shake the bag or the vial, it might interfere with the visualization of microbial growth, especially if there's only a small amount of growth and then you shake it up, it could be a lot harder to visualize that growth, and you could record the media fill as negative when in reality it was actually positive. So you, it's important to keep good documentation for your media fill test log. So the following is some information that you should include within your log. You want to include the date that the, des that the test was completed and then the dates that the test was inspected. You want to record the temperature that your media fill units were incubated at and then also the incubation period, so how long they were incubated for. It's a good idea to record the lot number, manufacturer, and expiration date of the media in case there are ever any um, issues with um, the quality of the media itself. And then also the results of the test. So was there growth, no growth, was it pass, fail, what sort of uh, retraining had to occur after it failed, things like that. And then if you're using positive controls, you also want to include the results of your positive controls um, within your log. If the positive controls end up being negative, um, something was either wrong with your media or something went wrong um, during the preparation of the positive controls, so you would have to uh, redo your media fill test at that point. So this is just some pictures of what positive media fill tests can look like. So the picture on your far right shows some microorganisms that are um, kind of congregating near the top of that uh, triptych soy auger. The one directly below that is kind of a stringy appearance. The one in the middle um, of the top row there shows congregation of microorganisms at the very bottom of the tube. And then the other three are mostly just cloudy um, kind of suspended particles. So cloudy, stringy, clumpy, all of those indicate positive media fill test as compared to just a clear solution. So policies and procedures. You must have a policy and procedure for media fill testing and for staff training and assessment. So media fill policy and procedure should include the frequency of media fill tests, who is media filled, who has to do a media fill test and when. You should include a step-by-step -step process of your media fill tests. You should include how your media 
field tests are incubated for what temperature and for how long, and the inspection of the media field tests, so who inspects them and how often. And then you also want to include a procedure for dealing with the failed media tests, which should include retraining, reassessment, and then the completion of three more media field tests. The staff training and assessment policy and procedure should include all aspects of training. Um, so what training is done, how often, uh, when retraining needs to occur, things like that. So the policy and procedure for staff training and assessment should be designed so that anyone could uh, complete your training program just by looking at your policy and procedures. So that concludes today's webinar about aseptic techniques, field assessment, and media field tests. So we'll go ahead and take some questions now. Let's see, we have a question about if I have a PRN pharmacist who does not help with clean room or sterile compounds, do they still need to pass the media fill? I would say no in this situation. If they are not in there physically sterile compounding, I would say no. They probably, um, and they're not cleaning or um, anything like that, they wouldn't necessarily need to do the media fill test. That being said, however, if they need to enter the buffer or controlled area to check any sort of preparations, they will need to do the hand hygiene, garbing, and gloving competency at, at a minimum. Um, is your risk level based on what you will be compounding? Um, because we have certain people doing risk level three compounding. So I guess they have various people doing different risk levels. Yes, yeah, so you can um, have different competencies for different employees. So you could have um, some employees doing the risk level three media fill where they're starting with the non-sterile, and then you could have other employees doing um, just your regular sterile media um, type of training. So then their competencies will differ depending upon. Every employee should be the same in that the basics are the same, but if someone's doing something more complicated, then they need to do the more complicated media fill and the more complicated training. And just a follow-up to that question is um, they may be on different uh, frequencies based on their risk level too. Okay, so then if, you're, if you have an employee that's doing risk level three compounding, they will automatically have to do the every six months. And it would be okay for the other employees as long as they're not doing risk level three to do the assessment annually. So you might have to stagger that. But keep in mind, if it's a risk level three compound, it stays risk level three throughout. So they, uh, someone who may not be doing the actual risk level three compounding may be drawing a dose out of a risk level three vial later on that it generally might be considered risk level one, but because it was a risk level three product, it would still be risk level three. Right. So anyone that deals with that risk level three preparation at any point still needs to do the risk level three competencies. Uh, we have a question about um, how do you recommend removing air bubbles from a syringe in a vertical flow hood without the syringe being in a vertical position? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, you know, there might be situations where you might have to, um, for a short amount of time, you know, put the syringe up and down. But for the most part, you should still be working at a 45-degree angle. Um, you can, you know, quickly turn the, that syringe and vial upwards, but you should, for the most part, be keeping it at a 45-degree angle. And it is possible to get most of the air out on a 45-degree angle, but um, for those really, really small air bubbles, um, you could quickly put it up and down. I have a question. Um, how should you account for first air when using a closed system transfer device for hazardous drug handling, uh, since most of these are click and lock and no needles are used? So with the closed system transfer devices, you, you would treat um, the spike of the closed system transfer device as a critical site, and then also um, the part where you're clicking together, that would be considered a critical site. So you would keep that uh, port within first air and then also you would avoid touching that port or um, that spike. You would just treat those as critical sites. So even though you're not using a needle, you still need to treat those as critical sites and keep those within first air as well. Um.
What is the contact time for sterile alcohol? The contact time for sterile alcohol is, is very short. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but generally, as I'm sure you, you all know, when you um, alcohol sterile alcohol has a very quick evaporation rate, so it's um, able to work very quickly. So I don't know exactly what it is, but it, it, it's a short contact time. And you have to let it evaporate to be effective. Yeah, so if you are um, wiping off your vial ports, um, you need to let it dry uh, before the disinfectant has done its job. We got multiple questions on gloves in the RABS, in an, uh, the isolator. Can you go over again that there weren't, uh, they want to know, do they need to put sterile gloves over the RABS gloves? Yes. So uh, RABS kind of come in two different ways. There is a sleeve that comes as a one-part system, so it's a sleeve and a gauntlet glove all together. So though in those situations, you would have the glove, the gauntlet gloves already attached to the sleeve. So you would put your sterile gloves inside your RABS and don the sterile gloves over that gauntlet gloves. The other type of RABS is a two-part system. So you are putting on, um, it just comes with the sleeve, and then you have to put on a, um, a glove on the end of that. So then that would be similar to a gauntlet glove. So in that case, you'll actually uh, be wearing two pairs of gloves because you'll put on um, the one glove that is required for part of the two-part system, and then again, you'll be putting the sterile gloves on inside the RAB. So essentially, you will be wearing two pairs of gloves, the gauntlet glove and then the sterile glove over that. And sterile gloves is only required for wrist level two. For wrist three. level two and three, so yes. A, a wrist level one would not be putting sterile gloves. Correct. Um, for three media fill tests, uh, this would be the initial. What is the expectation for separating these occasions? Different days or how how is that interpreted? Yeah, so we recommend that you're doing um, usually over a period of three days. So you would um, have uh, day one, do a media fill test. Day two, do a media fill test. And then day three, do a media fill test. Um, that way it's more of a, a true evaluation of their competency over just one really long compounding period. You'd want to sp spread it out over days three different days. Um, a question on, um, does risk level one and two need to use a positive control bacteria when doing media fill testing? No, it's not required um, because generally that media should already be sterile when you start. Um, it's You can if you feel like um, your media is maybe questionable, you think that it, it's not capable of growing anything, you could use a positive control, but it's really only uh, required for risk level three compounding, but it's um, you can use it if you feel the need to, but it's generally not required. What sort of training documentation, training or documentation, does the qualified ex assessor need to have? So the board hasn't really identified any um, specific um, qualifications that that person has to have. That's kind of up to our licensees to make the decision. Obviously, you don't want just um, you know some Joe Schmo to come in and, and do and do the assessment for you. It should be someone that has a knowledge of sterile compounding. It could be. It doesn't have to necessarily be a pharmacist. It could be um, a fellow coworker, uh, technician. It could be a supervisor. Um, some of the certifier companies even do it, so you, it's up to you guys to make that assessment. Um, question about reuse of garb. They want to know, do hair cover, mask, and shoe covers need to repl be replaced every time, or can they be reused within the same shift? No, they cannot be reused within the same shift, so they need to be replaced every time they are removed. Um, the next time you go to sterile compounding, uh, they should, you should be putting on new garb of the hair cover, shoe covers, mask. What is the, um, for current employees, what, what is required for their assessment? So current employees, uh, you don't need to necessarily go back and redo everyone's assessment. However, once it is time for their annual reassessment, so based upon when they did their last annual media fill, then you would go ahead and do the full aseptic technique skill assessment and the media fills according to the emergency rule. If you have any new employees that have started since um, August 4th when the emergency rule was 
um, considered to be effective, they would all need the aseptic technique skill assessment and media fill. All right, so we're out of time. Um, we got to a decent amount of questions, but unfortunately we ran out of time. So I would just like to review everybody about um, the continuing education requirements. You will have a post-webinar survey that pops up. You do not want to close the web browser window yet. Instead, you will click get a pop-up that says that the webinar has ended, and you will click close on that pop-up. A survey will then open. If you're using a phone or a tablet or sometimes uh, with the computers, you may not receive the survey. If you're having issues receiving the survey, go ahead and email um, compliance at pr.mo.gov, and they will um, go ahead and send you the questions that you need to answer. So the survey or those questions must be answered within 48 hours of the webinar in order to receive the CE credit. Then your certificates will be mailed to you within 30 days. And uh, just a reminder there that <clears throat> excuse me, this was recorded, so there will be a link available on the board's website within 30 days. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and there is another webinar at noon today. We'll have a lunch with the chief, which will be going over the 2016 legislative session. If you haven't signed up, you can go to the board's website, and there's a link uh, to sign register for that webinar. We will now uh, close the webinar.